Hey there, thank you for bopping on this video today. We are going to be talking about symbols. Well, what is a symbol, you may ask. Now, I know we all know that a symbol is something that represents something else. You've all been taught this since you were yay high. Now, let's talk in terms of how we're going to look at symbols in literature today. So, a symbol is something tangible. Now, if you don't know the word tangible, tangible just means something you can touch, hold, see, feel. It's there. So, like, this troll, 80s troll, this is tangible. He's a tangible thing. I can hold him. I can touch him. I can move him across the room. Tangible. All right, so symbols are tangible. You can see them. They're actually there in the story itself. So this might be an object. It might be an animal, so on and so forth. Now, it's a symbol is something that's tangible that represents something that's not tangible. So a lot of times this might be an idea, a concept, something that we can't necessarily grasp or hold in our hand. So we're going to be talking more about symbols today. So before we uh, get into looking at it in our story, I'm going to give you some examples of stories that we've uh, seen symbols in so far this year. All right, now, before we get into those stories, the first thing that I want to mention is that symbols are up for interpretation, meaning that I might see something that I'm like, ooh, this means this. And then somebody else sees it and they're like, mm, I think it doesn't. I think it means this. So symbols are up for interpretation. They're usually not directly stated, but sometimes they're super obvious. For instance, we'll talk about this later in the video in the Scarlet Ibis, which you've read super obvious symbolism there. Now, the reader has to make this connection oftentimes with symbols. So the reader has to be able to see, okay, here's an object. The author's gone into a ton of detail about this object or this thing. It must be symbolic some way, and then they need to be able to find some proof there. Now, there are both intended and unintended symbols. What's the difference? Well, an intended symbol was meant to be there by the author. What I mean by that is the author intentionally, when he or she was writing, included this to be symbolic. So they put uh, clues, they put hints that this was supposed to be symbolic in some sort of way. So for example, in Scarlet Ibis, the author titles the story The Scarlet Ibis, and that indicates to us that, okay, maybe this bird that's mentioned towards the end of the book might be important. Same thing with To Kill a Mockingbird. You've been reading this book. It's not about bird murder. It doesn't talk about killing mockingbirds the whole time. The mockingbird is going to come up in an upcoming chapter, and we need to figure out, all right, well, it clearly has maybe some sort of deeper meaning uh, than, than what we might just uh, read about it at surface value, right? So an unintended symbol is the opposite of that. So it's something that we as readers interpret. So we might see something as, sim as being symbolic. Maybe the author didn't intend for it to be there. Maybe they did it subconsciously. But uh, in order to even identify an unintended symbol, we need to be able to find details that prove that that is symbolic in some sort of way. And oftentimes symbols, whether it be intended or unintended symbols, uh, they'll go along with some of the themes we see throughout the story. All right, so here's an example of an intended symbol from Scarlet Ibis. Here's, here's the passage. So the last passage in the Scarlet Ibis. Doodle, doodle, I cried, shaking him, but there was no answer but the ropey rain. He lay very awkwardly with his head thrown far back, making his vermilion neck appear unusually long and slim. His little legs bent sharply at the knees, had never before seemed so fragile, so thin. I began to weep, and the tear-blurred vision in red before me looked very familiar. Doodle, I screamed above the pounding storm, and threw my body to the earth above his. For a long time, it seemed forever, I'd laid there crying, sheltering my fallen scarlet ibis from the heresy of the rain. So we see that the way Doodle is described here, Doodle's body is described here, that it mimics the description of the body of the scarlet ibis that was described in an earlier uh, on earlier pages of this short story. So like, for instance, the vermilion or the red neck, uh, it was long and slim. He's so fragile and so thin as the bird was described pages before. And then he essentially just directly tells us that Doodle is being symbolized by the ibis here by saying my fallen, sheltering my fallen scarlet ibis from the heresy of the rain. 
Now, you may be asking yourself, why does the author even need this symbol? Why do we even have it in the book? Well, uh, one important thing to look at when you're considering symbols is how do characters react to these objects, these items. Uh, so, for instance, when the ibis falls out of the tree, uh, we know that it has traveled a very far way. It has overcome so many different obstacles only to just die there on their lawn in front of this family. So much like Doodle, right? He has gone through so much in his life. He's overcome so much. He's lived past infancy, which the doctors nor his parents thought he was going to do. Um, and he's gone so far to only just die at the end of our story. So maybe the author is trying to pull our attention to important parts about Doodle and, and important, uh, important descriptions of Doodle there. We also want to look at how the, the rest of the family reacts when the ibis dies. For example, when they find the bird, they're intrigued at first, and then eventually the family loses interest. And the only one who seems to actually care about the bird and the fact that it's died here is Doodle. Maybe he feels some sort of connection with it. And the death of this bird foreshadows Doodle's ultimate death at the end of our story. Um, and we see that how the family treats this bird is much like how the parents treat Doodle throughout. Right. So like, obviously, they're concerned about his uh, well-being and whether he's going to survive at the beginning of the story. And then uh, they they don't really necessarily throughout, though, care about how he's doing or check in on him or really pay close attention to him. And it's not until the very end of the story that Brother truly appreciates and protects Doodle. Um, and again, we see instances of him protecting him or caring for him throughout the story. But that final scene where he's actually throwing his body over his brothers and describing him as this scarlet ibis as uh, the first time we're really seeing him protect his brother unconditionally and we see the love he has but unfortunately much like the ibis dies earlier a few pages before it's too late doodle is already dead um, it also helps us see how the narrator feels about uh, the death of his brother. So he describes the ibis a few pages before and how beautiful it was in death. And finally, by the end of the story, the narrator is seeing his brother as beautiful and as this unique uh, person. And he, he couldn't see it at the beginning of our story or throughout the story because he's so focused on the fact that he's not like everybody else, that he has these physical disabilities and he can't see the beauty and, and just how unique his brother is. So a lot packed in just one symbol here. Now, how do we find the symbols when maybe they're not so obvious or maybe they are obvious? We still need to figure them out. Uh, so we're going to take a look at one today that is uh, stated in the text that we know is going to be symbolic for the Mockingbird, which is the Mockingbird itself. Uh, before we get into looking at the Mockingbird, I just want to talk quickly about the process we're going to use. So. A couple things as far as symbols go. One, a lot of times symbols might be objects, they might be colors, they might be actions or particular scenes that stand out or that are mentioned in great detail. So once you figure out something that might be symbolic, you want to look for specific details and zero in on those details. So how are people reacting to this object or this animal or whatever it may be? These are all, these details are all going to be clues as to what that symbol might represent. Now, you can't just be like, oh, the scarlet ibis represents death and then not explain it. Or the scarlet ibis represents creation. Okay, well, explain it. You need to be able to provide details. You can't just say, well, I just think this is what I think. If you can't provide details that support your symbol, then most likely it might not be symbolic. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the mockingbird. And the first thing we're going to do is take a look at a couple passages. Actually, I lied. The first thing we're going to do is talk about how we maybe could figure out that a mockingbird would be symbolic in the first place. So first of all, it's literally mentioned in the title, as we talked about earlier. So much like the Scarlet Ibis, the mockingbird is not the focus of the entire plot. It's just mentioned at points in the story. So maybe the bird has a deeper meaning. And then also the mockingbird is, while it's not the main focus, is mentioned numerous times throughout the plot. So a lot of times when an author references something either in great detail or numerous times throughout, there's a chance that it could be symbolic or represent uh, something at a deeper level than what we may have originally thought. 
So here are some passages for us to take a look at. Um, here is the first one where we first hear the mockingbird explicitly talked about by the characters. Atticus said to Jem one day, I'd rather you shoot at tin cans in the backyard, but I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them, but remember it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. And then later on in that chapter, mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat up people's gardens. They don't nest in cord cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us. That's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. So both Atticus and Miss Maudie are telling us that it is a sin to kill a mockingbird. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what details are we learning about the mockingbird? Well, it's a sin to kill them. Uh, we also know that they make this beautiful music for people to enjoy, and they don't eat at people's gardens or build nests in uh, pesky places. So they seem pretty chill, pretty cool birds. Now, Again, we have to think through, all right, we have these details, we know this about them, so what could they represent in our story beyond just, you know, this bird we shouldn't shoot or kill? All right, so I'm going to ask myself, all right, well, these birds don't do anything to hurt anybody, and they just do nice, kind things. Well, maybe the birds represent people in the story who are nice and kind and, and don't do anything to harm anybody, people who are innocent. Now, the fact that... It keeps bringing up, don't kill them, don't hurt the mockingbird, don't kill them. We're to assume like, okay, well, maybe then mockingbirds are something that should be protected and not harmed. So maybe the whole like, don't kill a mockingbird, what the author's trying to convey with that is like, don't harm people who are innocent. All right, seems like it might work because so far in our story, People who are innocent have been persecuted at times. So think Boo Radley, right? He seems like he might be an okay guy. He mends Jem's pants. He's leaving the kids gifts. He has been locked away for 15 plus years. However, it doesn't seem like he does all those awful bad things that people says he does. Um, so he might be seen as a potential mockingbird in our story that is innocent, that has done some kind things. Again, also putting the blanket on Scout. Uh, he's done some really kind acts, but still people say awful things about him and don't treat him or his family well. So as you think about this, Blue Radley is probably one of the more obvious mockingbirds we see so far throughout our story, but there's probably others as well, right? So think of other characters who haven't done anything wrong, who are innocent, who get either persecuted or harmed in some sort of way. So we might, if we ask ourselves, well, who do we typically consider to be innocent in society? Well, children. So do we see Scout or Jem being harmed or persecuted in some sort of way? <clears throat> Cecil Jacobs and all the uh, kids that are giving them a hard time and uh, criticizing Atticus for uh, defending Tom Robinson, a black man in their community. Uh, maybe Atticus, could he be a mockingbird? So somebody who's innocent that gets persecuted or harmed in some sort of way. So um, again, the mockingbird is a pretty obvious symbol for us because the book has titled it and we see it come up at different points in our story. But as we continue to read, I challenge you to see who are the mockingbirds in our story? Who else besides Boo Radley or maybe Scout and the Kids or Atticus, who could we consider to be mockingbirds? So again, if a mockingbird is someone who is innocent, who deserves to be protected and not harmed, who else could we consider to be mockingbirds in our story? And furthermore, who can we be who who might we consider to be mockingbirds in society today? So who are the people who are innocent in today's society who need to be protected, who might, uh, for whatever reason, be uh, getting persecuted? All right. That is symbolism and specifically symbolism for the mockingbird. If you have any questions, make sure you are reaching out to your teacher. See ya.